ultimate trump card for the North in many ways in this that changes their mind on what needs to be done is the Dred Scott decision. In many ways, this is the Northern nightmare. Long story short for Dred Scott, and briefly to summarize the case, Dred Scott was a slave whose owner was an army officer who lived in Missouri. His owner then took him to Illinois to briefly reside in Illinois with him while he was doing business in Illinois and then return. The question before the high court was, by going to free soil, did that make Dred Scott a free man? That was the big question that had to be asked about this. So abolitionists, activists, raised money and generated legal defense on Dred Scott's behalf and assisted him to bring the case forward. The case worked its way all the way to the Supreme Court, where Roger B. Taney, a Southerner, appointed the high court by Andrew Jackson, um, and slavery advocate, wanted to end this issue once and for all. And not just because he was greedy for wanting things for the South. Taney saw the potential that this crisis had for destroying the Union. So he wanted to legally, definitively end it. Because if he can end it, he can eliminate this issue once and for all and not see the Union unraveled over it. So Taney makes a three-part decision. The first part, he says, is that slaves are chattel. Slaves are property. As property, slaves cannot sue any more than this marker I'm holding in my hand can file legal action for me, against me for the way that I use it or don't use it. He argues slaves are property and as such have no legal rights. That's the second element. Since property is property, as an inanimate object, livestock can't sue, markers can't sue, television sets can't sue, slaves cannot sue either. And the famous quote from his case is a black man has no, whites, has no rights that a white man is bound to respect. He could have stopped there. He was, he's essentially throwing the case out of court. He's saying the high court cannot hear the Dred Scott case because Dred Scott is a citizen is, or is not a citizen, and as such, he can't bring a case to court. But remember Tawney's intentions to finish the slavery debate once and for all. He faithfully on his own takes a third step. He goes beyond this narrow scope of this to make the ruling broader. And in his third and final step, he says, because slaves are property and because property cannot sue and because property has no rights because it's property, your third element here, as such, it is impossible for any governing agent to restrict slavery because slavery is an issue of property and property rights. And individual American citizens' property rights, that is, white citizens' property rights, would trump any limitation on any level of government, local, state, or federal, from saying you can't, you can't harbor that. It would be no different than any of you going on a vacation trip from one state to another and being told by that state what you could or could not bring in terms of clothing, a suitcase, travel items, personal effects, whatever. If you can bring your suitcase in any of your clothes, you can bring your slave too because your slave is property. The upshot of this case is the North is horrified because Tawney's decision, Tawney's decision essentially not only invalidates the Missouri Compromise in 3630 for once in all time, which had already Kansas and Nebraska had kind of done, it goes further to say that all these green states, which are the free states, they have no right to have claim legal status as free states because decisions on slave or free revolve around what the individual American citizen does in terms of choosing to own or not own property. It's almost similar to the sort of debate you could hear on cigarette smoking, which we've talked about as, as an earlier example. The argument of the Tawny court is, if you don't like slavery, fine. Don't partake of the system. Don't own slaves. But don't, proceed, don't presume to tell me as another American citizen what I can and cannot do as an American citizen. I have the right to slavery. It's constitutional. No state, local, or federal agency can limit or deny that right. If you don't like it, if you're offended by it, fine. Don't partake. But otherwise, you have no right to limit me. So in theory, any state could be a slave state because it would be a personal decision of an American citizen to have a slave or not have a slave wherever they were. This mortifies the North. And as such, <clears throat> and as such, the North comes to the conclusion, Northerners begin to come to the conclusion, the only way to remedy these kinds of things is to get the kind of people in power in government who can select Supreme Court justices, who can make the laws, who can interpret the laws, and who can enforce the laws. Prior to this decision, the North was not speaking politically unified as one voice. There was division. Some You had people voting for Whigs, people voting for Democrats, some voting for Free Soilers, the Know-Nothings Republicans, etc. After this, in the four years between this decision, the, the, uh, the, the 1857 decision on Dred Scott, and then the three years between that and the election of 1860, the North politically becomes unified. They become unified behind the Republican Party. <clears throat> 
and getting us there leads us to your final slide for this lesson, The Union at the Precipice. By the Lincoln-Douglas debates of 1858, Stephen Douglas sees the Democratic Party under his leadership as the last best hope to save the Union. And he goes into debates with a previously mentioned Abraham Lincoln for the state Senate seat from Illinois. And in these famous Lincoln-Douglas debates, Douglas comes up with the Freeport Doctrine, which argues that not only is the Dred Scott decision legal, which means slavery can be allowed everywhere, but it would be up to local groups, local levels of government, to then put the laws in place to guarantee that slavery could exist unmolested. Lincoln calls this kind of a fraud, and actually the South calls it a fraud too. The South sees this argument and agrees with it and says, well, we don't like that. Slavery could be legal and people could still make laws against it to not let it happen in their region. The South wants to push for ironclad guarantees, legal constitutional guarantees that slavery is and will be allowed everywhere. And so the fallout of this debate is that Douglas wins the Senate seat, but Lincoln in many ways wins no longer view because as the Republican candidate, he gets noticed for the first time as a national figure speaking on the limitations of slavery, which is the Republican position. Slavery ought to be limited to where it is and not allowed further elsewhere in the Union. We've seen the Northern nightmare in the form of the Dred Scott decision, which leads to paranoia in the North about uh, the, the plans of the slave power conspiracy to dominate the Union. And the final nightmare is a Southern nightmare. It's the John Brown raid. John Brown, an activist who you'd seen in the Kansas-Nebraska Act, or at least in the Kansas-Nebraska Breeding Kansas activities, decides that the solution is to arm a series of slaves and abolitionists, but mostly slaves, free them, give them more guns and weapons, and have them run south, freeing slaves as they go, and end slavery once and for all. He fails spectacularly, and in so doing is seen somewhat as a, somewhat as a martyr in the North, but is seen by an absolute demon in the South. And the fact that some Northerners are willing to say that he's wrong, but we know where he, we understand where he's coming from, for Southerners to hear that is what leads Southerners to say, we must part ways. This union is essentially going in directions we don't want it to go. And if this is your view that he's not an evil monster, but just a guy whose heart's in the right, pl right place, who went about things in the wrong way, we cannot remain in a union with people in that position. And so the election of 1860 then finally pushes and pushes this to, what, to its ultimate conclusion. Lincoln wins the presidency with those northern states speaking with one political voice. All the northern states, green states on my map, they could all vote. They all voted Republican in that election. Lincoln won only 39% of the popular vote. Less than four out of 10 Americans voted for him, but he won in the right states to get the right electoral votes that he won an electoral victory of about 60%. At this point, the South says the Union is going directions we don't want it to go, and open discussion of secession takes place. South Carolina, where all this had started so many years ago, we'd seen with exposition and protest and the tariff crisis, and John Calhoun is the first state to lead the Union. Eleven more states will follow before it's all said and done. Now, the last attempt at compromise is uh, John Crittenden from Kentucky. A senator attempts to impose in the time between Lincoln's election and his inauguration attempts to get the Crittenden Compromise passed, which was saying, let's just go back to the 3630 line saying everything south will be slave, everything north will be free. But by that point in time, both sides, north and south, have said, we no longer want a half loaf. We no longer want compromises. We want what we want. And we're willing to, particularly in the southern case, we're willing to fight or secede to get it. And this is the pathway in many ways. This should not have been an extensive review for many of you of things that you were unfamiliar with. Every course in American history covers this in great detail because it's critical to understand this is a threshold, a hinge, a hinging point between everything that came before and everything that comes after in the American experience revolves around these pivotal 10 years and then of course the five years that follow which are going to be the American Civil War. But that's a lesson for next time.